All right, everybody. Uh, I just want to. I'm, I'm Stephen Cracknell with U.S. Medical IT, and Sam asked if I could come and speak a little bit about ransomware today. So uh, we're going to talk about how to prepare your organization and how to avoid ransomware. So uh, this is the this is the um, screen you don't want to come walking into your practice and look at on a Monday morning. This is what a ransomware attack will routinely look like. The screens change a little bit, but for the most part, it has a couple of uh, key components you're gonna see on everything. They're gonna give you a time. So basically, they're gonna tell you you've got X number of hours to pay your ransom. Uh, often, they will increase the cost the longer it takes, and then once you get to the end of the time, then they're gonna just uh, figure that you're not gonna pay, and then you won't be able to unlock the device at all. Um, what is enabling this experience? is Bitcoin. We're gonna talk a little bit about Bitcoin later today, but um, Bitcoin's a big enabler of the ransomware um, industry. So we'll talk about what that is. Bitcoin can be used for lots of good things. It can also be used for things like this, where it's basically anonymous transfer of funds uh, across uh, national lines. So I'm gonna give you a quiz at the end. I'm gonna give you the answers now, but these are the big three things. If you're gonna walk away with anything today, if you can take care and ensure and, and routinely test that these things are happening inside your organization, you're gonna be in a much better place. At the end of our presentation, I have 15 steps to take, but these are the big three. These are the ones that if you're gonna walk away with three items, uh, write these down. Number one, versioned and tested offsite backup. So you notice I didn't just say have a backup versioned and tested offsite. All three of those words are important because there's lots of ways for backups to go wrong and the backup is your last salvation if you get attacked by a rans if, if you're infected with a ransomware um, virus. Purchase more cybersecurity. We're gonna go through some math here on the cost of a breach of a single record and we're gonna look at how much it would cost your practice for just the last uh, year of, of active patients. And we all know there's, there's a long tail of patients that you've seen in years past that are still sitting in your electronic medical record system. Train and test your staff. Uh, this is your first line of defense. The ransomware guys are looking at all different types of trajectories in order to infect your, your, um, your systems. Uh, still, one of the number one ways of attacking is to go after your employees, get them to click on a link, and that launches the ransomware attack and it, it, it propagates throughout your entire network. So uh, make sure that your staff are aware of what to watch for and are careful about links and attachments because that's, that's routinely, if they're gonna come through your, your uh, employee's path, it's gonna be through one of those two items, a link or an attachment. I, had, I was talking with um, the, the director of IT for a large anesthesia group, 2,500 anesthesiologists all across the country, and one of his questions to me was, isn't it dying off? Isn't it going away? Is, I, I don't hear as much about ransomware as I did in 2017, 2016. The answer is no. And, and here's a, a, a prime example of this. This was just released last Wednesday by the FBI. They've identified that over 500,000 routers have been infected with um, not ransomware in this case, malware. Um, and uh, this, this is a, a major attack. It's linked back to the, the Russian, um, uh, it says Russian linked, but basically it's the Russian military is linked to this particular attack. And so this has been sitting quietly on 500,000 of these routers. Um, and I've, I list out the ones they've identified so far. This list may grow, but if you have any of these routers either in your office or at your home, the FBI says one thing here, reboot your router. Because what that's gonna do is that the FBI has already taken control of the, uh, the server that infects what they call the, the second stage. And so if you reboot your router, they'll be able to identify that you have this infection. They'll be able to contact you and work with you to, to help mitigate the risks that are there. Um, so even if it's not one of these, we're doing it with our clients. We're rebooting all of our routers just to see if they call back to one of these uh, servers that have the, the malware infected on them. And this is just a great example of how, you know, there's so much money to be had that there's no, there's no uh, stopping this particular um, approach of using malware to get money from you. One of the big things on this one is that it had the capability of actually uh, d disabling the devices permanently. So the Russian military could have triggered a mass uh, disablement of 500,000 routers. Uh, this is globally, but around the world, 
uh, and that you can be sure that that would have had a major impact uh, on, on all of us if that had happened. Um, you're going to see this. I'm going to talk about this more and more, but ransomware is an industry, and they're, they're anticipating $2.1 trillion is going to be lost through data breaches uh, by the year 2019. And to give you some sense of, of scope of that, worldwide GDP is $76 trillion. So we're talking about nearly 3% of global GDP is going to be spent on these breaches. So a significant amount of money uh, is going through into this, this, this cyber economy uh, that, that we call kind of the ransomware industry. So overall, here's my agenda for today. We're gonna to talk through uh, how healthcare IT differs from standard IT. And there are some, some core differences that make you guys a higher risk profile than if you were in a manufacturing business or a retail business. Uh, there's a growing ransomware economy. We're gonna talk through how it works. So you have the understanding of, of the functionality of, of how this industry is, is blossoming, growing, and, and what that impact is on you. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to protect your organization and uh, talk about some of the impacts of ransomware. So I've peppered through here some specific case studies. Uh, some have impacted our clients, folks that we have known. Uh, also, some of these are just uh, industry-wide um, examples that, that, that call out a specific scenario of uh, learning. So let's first talk about how healthcare differs from general IT, uh, healthcare IT gen from general IT. First off, your a particular industry is labor intensive and technology dependent. Now why that matters is it means that your cost, as soon as you get disabled by, whether it's a fire or flood or whatever, if, if your people are on the clock, you're paying them, and uh, you're not able to bill, then you've got a, a high uh, cost of downtime. Next thing, you've got a lot of mobile providers. A lot of breaches happen from leaving a laptop at a conference or a phone in a cab. Um, so being sure that you've got all of these devices floating around that may have <coughs> patient information sitting on them uh, creates uh, more of an exposure area for um, hackers and, and anybody that's trying to steal that information to, uh, to acquire it. EPHI, your patient information, is super valuable on the dark web. So it usually costs between $1 and $8 for a patient record, or not patient record, but a, but a, a stolen um, a profile of an individual. And you can bet the $8 ones are the ones that have financial information and patient information. And the reason why that is, is the patient information usually has family history, social security number, date of birth, everything that they need to go around and try and steal somebody's identity. So your, your particular type of information that you collect and put onto your servers is particularly sensitive uh, and, and, and a high value target for cyber criminals. You're heavily regulated, of course. We've talked to you, I heard listening about HIPAA this morning. That just increases all of your costs. So if something happens, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cost to resolve those particular breaches is, is much, and we're going to talk about it, much, much higher than it would be in, in different industries. And then another problem, 40% of the breaches are not caused by you. Now, you may have to pay for it, but it could be caused by a, 40% uh, of the time it's caused by a business associate. So this is something to be very aware of. Make sure that you have a signed business associate agreement with all the people who have access to your patient information and make sure that inside of that BAA, there's accountability if they're at fault, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be responsible for remediating those breaches. So this is a pretty interesting diagram I'm about to show you, but one big point to put out here is uh, Health and Human Services, it labels ransomware attacks at the very least a security incident, and in most cases, it's considered a breach. Uh, there's, there's a whole FAQ around ransomware, but the important factor of this is if it's a data breach, then you've got a lot more steps and a lot more expenses associated with that particular uh, attack than if it was just an incident, but you were able to contain the fact that no PHI was lost during that incident. IBM, uh, before I get onto that, one of the other points they made in here is that if you encrypt your data, then that will protect you from having to declare a breach. So if your PCs and your servers are, are, are already encrypted with your encryption, uh, if somebody comes in, and, and you may still lose data, they come in and, and, and overlay a second layer of encryption, you can declare that they never had access to that data to begin with. You don't need to declare a breach. So that's an important point. If, if you'll see on my list of 15 things, number four is to make sure everything is encrypted because that gives you an extra layer of protection and, and can help you avoid having to declare a breach. 
IBM reported an increase 6,000% from the tax from 2015 to 2016. This hasn't slowed down, but you can tell they figured out. Bitcoin combined with all of these pre-canned, and we're gonna talk about them, cyber kits, cyber, cyber uh, hacker kits, uh, have led to this, this uh, explosion in attacks. And this diagram gives you a sense. These are all uh, ransomware, um, uh, different versions of ransomware that have come out since 2010 all the way through to 2017. Uh, I'd like to, I, I can't wait for them to kind of release 2017 to 2018, but this gives you a sense of how much money can be made by executing ransomware attacks. These are all different flavors of ransomware that have been released since 2010. One, when I talk with physicians, one of the things that I think gets stuck in their, in their minds is that this is a problem for big hospital systems, big um, uh, physician groups, and maybe big EMR vendors. All scripts just got hit by this back in January. But that, that, that perception uh, is fed by the fact that if you're gonna read something in the news about healthcare, uh, you know, breaches and hacks, they're only gonna focus on these big, big attacks that hit hospital systems, big uh, medical groups and the likes. That doesn't mean it's not happening to small one, two, three, four, five physician practices. It just means that that doesn't make the news. So uh, I think it's important to call out that, yeah, these guys make the news, but the reality of it is criminals prefer a lot of small transactions. So they're not going after the 20 grand, 70 grand deals. They are trying those, but those are like the big fish but they feed themselves on this, the smaller transactions going after small physician groups. And this, this jump that you see here from the $300 range up to $1,000 range, it happened from 2015 to 2016, same time you saw that explosion of ransomware attacks, is when they realize that a small business owner will pay more for their data than a consumer will pay for their photos. At first, ransomware was really going after home, home, home users trying to encrypt their, their pictures, and then going out there and trying to get them to pay them $300. So that's changing. Now the target is uh, small and medium businesses. If they can get a big fish, they'll go after a big fish, and that's what gets the news. But really, this is the group that's the primary target. You've got the best data, and you're willing to pay for it to get it back. That, so that makes you a rich target for these types of ransomware attacks. So let's talk about get, paying to get it back. This is something that obviously that, that's their whole premise of this whole industry is that they can pop up a window and say, give us some Bitcoin, right? So the idea here is, hey, just give us that Bitcoin. Tell you the honest truth, they're criminals. They're not that honest and they may not be that competent. So what ends up happening is, yeah, you might give them the Bitcoin, but whether or not they give you a key back or whether that's the right key that they give you back, they don't really care. Right? They got what they wanted out of that transaction and they're, are not, they're anonymous. So they're gonna disappear and you'll never, never be able to regain their data. So 30% of, of people pay the ransom, 72% of those are not able to fully recover the information after paying that ransom. So that's what feeds the industry is the 30% that are paying the ransom and, and, and encourages them to continue going. And most of those folks aren't able to recover what's out there. Um, NTT Security reported back in 2016, 88% of the attacks were targeted towards healthcare. Again, you guys are a prime target. The last one's the most interesting, I think. This uh, Ponom uh, Institute study, they, they run this study, IBM funds it, and they run this every year, $380 per record. So usually it's 140 to, to remediate a breached um, uh, P, PII or, patient, or um, personally identifiable information. So if you're in a, uh, finance industry, retail, you lose credit card information, it's gonna cost you $140. This group has to pay up to 380. Obviously you've got more regulations, you've got more steps to go through, there's fines that are gonna come from HHS and potentially from the state. So the cost of a breached healthcare record is dramatically higher. I gave you this just to give you some sense. One of the, the highlights I said was make sure you get more cybersecurity insurance. And, and Jim's gonna come in here and talk about some other scenarios of that same case. But this was provided by MGMA just to help people calculate how many active patients do I have in the last 12 months, right? So if you're seeing 18 patients a day and a patient will come and see you maybe twice a year, uh, through that math you have approximately 2,160 records. Times that by that 380 number we saw on the previous page, and you're closing in on a million dollars to remediate that particular breach. And again, that's just the last year of records. If you've been in business for 10 years, your number might be five times that. So benefits of cyber insurance, ECMC, 
I have to tell you, uh, I can get you a link to this, but this ransomware attack uh, article right here breaks down specifically what happened after the breach. And I think that's really telling, all the steps that needed to be taken. Basically, in this hospital, they had to wipe every single hard drive on every single PC, reinstall the operating system, and put it back into business. Um, and, and the point with this one is that this particular hospital system, just five months before, had raised their, their cyber insurance from two million to five, uh, 10 million. So they 5 x their insurance, five months before they got hit by a ransomware attack. So, and 10 million is not the end. They're not done at 10 million. That was just at the point of writing this particular article. Uh, but it certainly saved their bacon as far as how much money they had to pull out of their own pockets. So let's talk a little bit about the ransomware economy itself. I'm gonna play a short video here. It's, it's interesting in the sense that it's pretty pro uh, Bitcoin. And, and Bitcoin's got two sides to it. There's lots of good things about Bitcoin. And there's a lot of dark things about Bitcoin, but what this one does do alongside of kind of talk, touting the benefits of Bitcoin, it does talk to you a little bit about how Bitcoin works. So I'd like to play it, just give some context as we talk about the overall uh, ransomware industry. So let me just hit the, hit the play what button What is here. Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency. Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet. Compared to other alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that the fees are much lower. You can use them in every country. Your account cannot be frozen, and there are no prerequisites or arbitrary limits. Let's look at how it works. Several currency exchanges exist where you can buy and sell Bitcoins for dollars, euros, and more. Your Bitcoins are kept in your digital wallet on your computer or mobile device. Sending Bitcoins is as simple as sending an email, and you can purchase anything with Bitcoin. The Bitcoin network is secured by individuals called miners. Miners are rewarded newly generated Bitcoins for verifying transactions. After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger. Bitcoin opens up a whole new platform for innovation. The software is completely open source and anyone can review the code. Bitcoin is changing finance the same way the web changed publishing. When everyone has access to a global market, great ideas flourish. Bitcoins are a great way for businesses to minimize transaction fees. It doesn't cost anything to start accepting them, and it's easy to set up. There are no chargebacks, and you'll get additional business from the Bitcoin economy. For more information about Bitcoin, visit weusecoins.com. Um, but I think uh, some of the important points from that one uh, is that it's, it was global, right? You can transfer funds across international boundaries. There's no tracing, it's anonymous, right? And uh, not only does the legitimate uh, economy have access to it, so do, so do cyber criminals. So it's basically this bridge between these two worlds. Think about it, back in the 90s, what would you have to do if you had to pay a ransom? Put it in a suitcase, right? And carry it somewhere, or some bridge or something, and you're gonna pay off some, some, some uh, awful evil person. Now you can transfer that information, uh, that, that finance uh, electronically across the world to a place where maybe they won't be so strict in trying to find those criminals, i.e. Russia. So this is a situation where, you know, this, this is a way of draining our economy, 3%, as we saw through these cyber breaches. So something, something to consider. This is, this is a big um, uh, component of the, of the ransomware economy. I want to talk a little bit about the actors, the bad actors. I think everybody, when they hear about hackers, they have one impression, whatever that happens to be, the, the kid in the basement with the, you know, of, of their, their parents' house, or some evil guy with a balaclava on, you know, working in front of a computer, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but the reality is there's different actors, they have different motivations. And it's important to kind of understand each one of them as they, as they rear their heads here. So, Obviously, there's this category of non-professional, and, and this is kind of like the, the movies of the 90s where you've got the, the high school kid that's able to open up a computer and hack into the NSA. Uh, you've got this concept of a, of a gray hat, which, is, which are these players that have both a legitimate business and then this other aspect where uh, their, their systems and tools can be used for illegitimate activities. Prime example, Bitcoin. So those are, those are gray hat players in this whole industry. And you've got the black hats. This is the actual folks that are making a business out of uh, stealing money from businesses. And I have to tell you, the United States is the primary target for, uh, for these attacks. Obviously, Europe gets impacted as well, but the brunt of ransomware attacks are directed towards the United States because this is where the money is. 
Um, but they, they are actually getting more and more sophisticated in the sense that they'll actually have organizational structures with teams that have specific focuses. We're going to talk a little bit about spear phishing attacks that are out there. And the spear phishing attacks uh, can be done, um, you know, they actually have a research team that's going out there and finding out who is the physician in this particular group, who's the lead physician, and what's the office administrator's name, and how do we uh, pose as the, you know, the lead physician, ask the, the, um, the office administrator if they can transfer $10,000 into this account in the next, you know, hour, because uh, that's how those particular attacks tend to happen. So those black hats are, are serious business people that are out there to make a profit. And then you've got this other side, these political, state-sponsored attacks, like the, the, the um, attack we saw that uh, was released last week, where we've got the, the Russian military having infected 500,000 routers. Uh, you've got North Korea that have done specific attacks against the United States. Uh, China uh, stealing intellectual property. So all these different actors out there with different motivations, maybe not directly trying to profit from you, but also uh, out there developing uh, attacks and, and uh, continuing to grow this particular industry. And, and there's another group called hacktivists, which are politically motivated. Maybe they're coming after a particular individual or a company because they don't agree with GMOs, for example. So there's all sorts of motivations out there and, and they use different techniques. Uh, in order to get their work done, but this is just gives you a sense of, of the spectrum of, of individuals that are out there uh, working in this industry. Cybercrime's never been easier for new entrants, and the reason for this is that there's actually an ecosystem for tools that they use to come in and attack. So basically, there's a, a, a version of, of Amazon or eBay out there on the dark web where tools are sold that are used to come and attack businesses like yours. So for example, one of those is this remote control Trojan. What this particular company has done is they've gone out and hacked phones like the ones you have in your hands right there. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't done anything with it besides hack it, and then they will give the, the, uh, the control of those phones over to another individual. So basically they'll say, hey, I've hacked 1,000 phones. You can have this whole list of phones and be able to start executing commands against it. So they basically can, they do their, their function, which is to go out there and get people to install specific applications that allow them to get plugged into the phones, and, and then they're listed on this, and, and they sell these lists uh, because they can be used for other nefarious purposes. Another example is called this account checker. So if you've gone out to the dark web and you've downloaded a list of 1,000 credentials and you paid 1,000 or $3,000 for those credentials, you can go and use this account checker to check whether or not those can be used to log into Facebook, LinkedIn, a bank, uh, because a lot of people use you know, the same credentials, the same username and password for multiple different sites. So if one site loses your credentials, goes onto the dark web, it gets sold, you use a system like this and you find out what other systems could I log into using you know, uh, the credentials that were, were purchased from, from the dark web. So these are all tools just to make it easier to be a hacker and, uh, and it, it makes it uh, more expensive for us because they become more and more effective. So here's a scenario, San Francisco last year was hit by a ransomware attack. This is the, the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, so their bus system, essentially. Um, they were ready. They actually had a full backup of all of their data, and they didn't pay the ransom. Sounds like they got away, right? They basically got away scot-free. Let's look at what happened here. So how much did that cost the transit system? They were asked to pay $73,000 to unlock that data, and they did not pay it. So they saved $73,000. However, it took them two days to recover the data that was sitting in a different data center. So they had to bring it back, restore it, plug everything back in. They were down for two days. For those two days, they kept operating. They gave 735,000 free rides at $2.25 a ride for, for two days. Damage, $3.3 million. So it's not about the ransom in that case, it's about the downtime. And you gotta think about your business as well. You should know what's the cost of one hour of downtime for my particular business. And I've actually got a calculator if you want, you can get, get me after the show. But you can do some quick math just using high level numbers from your business to figure out what your cost is per hour of downtime. Because that's an important factor when you're talking to your IT department about how long will it take to recover. I know you have an offsite backup, if something happens, am I down for four hours, three days, a week? Then you can do the math and figure out if you need to spend some more time doing that. 
I want to give you a sample spearfishing attack uh, that came to uh, US medical IT, my business. So this one was targeted at my VP of operations, and it was sent from me, supposedly. So I'm going to pull it up here so we can take a look at it. So my VP of ops got this message at 8.14 AM. It came from me. Let's see if I actually have a laser pointer here. All right, there. So it came from me, supposedly, right? To, to Kevin, timely response. And it says down here, are you at the desk? Let me know. I need you to handle something for me. You can bet what they wanted me to do, what they were going to say if he said, yeah, I'm at my desk. Can you please transfer $10,000 from this account to that account? Now, he caught it. And there were some, some this is not a particularly sophisticated attack, because you'll see that's my name, but that's certainly not my email address. And then it went to Kevin instead of Kevin.Brockus, which is our, his full email address. And I always send it to his full email address. It has very poor grammar. My grammar is bad, but not this bad. Uh, he didn't put a period here. Uh, he is regards Steve Cracknell. I use Steven, full, full with PH. And I have, a, I have an Android, and this was sent from an iPhone. So all those reasons, he caught it, came back and said, this isn't Steven just to make people aware that if somebody's trying to contact them, uh, it's probably not them. So you need to put controls in place no matter what. I was at a MGMA event uh, up in, in Tulsa talking about the same subject, and, and a, there was a, a, a bank, VP bank there, a VP of the bank there. One of the major attacks on these spearfishing at, uh, attacks is, is this money transfer. And so putting controls in your business, so let's say your office administrator has full control of your banks, pretty common. And, and, uh, and if she gets a request, or he gets a request to transfer money from one bank to another bank, maybe that's not that, that uh, uh, unique. Uh, they, they, they conduct that transaction and then find out later on that they're actually a victim of spear phishing. And usually what happens, they'll take the first 10 and they'll go after 120. So it's not like they're gonna just stop after they've taken some money out of your bank. They'll stop when there's no more money to take out of your bank. So how do you protect your business against this? One point I want to kind of call out first up is EMR. Uh, I'll often hear folks say, hey, I don't have anything to worry about. My, I've got a cloud EMR. The uh, thing I want you to think through and consider is what other files do you have in your business that if they weren't there tomorrow, they'd impact the overall profitability and, and ability for you to function? These are just some examples, HR files, taxes, forms that you've developed inside to, to, to manage processes, faxes, scans, maybe reports that have been uh, exported out of your, your, uh, your financial system or out of your EMR, uh, sales and marketing, training, compliance. Uh, the list goes on and on. So one point I'm going to make here about making backups is don't just assume because you have a cloud EMR, you're free and clear. You need to think through all the different systems inside your business and make sure all of those files and um, uh, records are, are, are backed up offsite. A number one w w uh, reason why a ransomware attack is successful is because you have an unsuccessful backup. And this can happen for multiple reasons. This particular stat here, um, this was collected by, uh, I don't remember, I think it's PNOM Institute again, but only 42% of IT pros were able to successfully restore all the data after ransomware attacks. They had a backup, they just hadn't tested it, or it was a situation where the backups also got encrypted, which is a big one, uh, or they, they lost data since the, the last encryption. So maybe they only back up a full backup offsite once a week. So they've lost a week of data, which is still a significant amount of, of disruption. But this, this one's the big one, that, that this backups uh, drives were also encrypted. We see that pretty often. I was just in an office the other week where the individual had a full backup, and we checked in. It was working successfully. Problem was it was plugged into a portable USB hard drive, and he only had one of them. So there was, if if a ransomware attack were to happen inside of his organization, in all likelihood, the ransomware is going to go and infect that backup as well as the EMR system that's there. So this is more common than you think is having backup drives where there's not an offsite version that's disconnected from the network. So just make sure if, if you're in a situation where you are backing up but there's nothing offsite, uh, you're still exposed to a ransomware. Yes, sir. I have a Google Gmail. Yes. Yeah. Right? Excellent. That's far better than having a hard drive plugged into your, your uh, server. So yeah, Google, Microsoft both have what's called versioning. The one thing I, would, I want you to, to verify is that you have versioning enabled. So if you can roll back to an older version, because it still may go out there and infect those files up in Google. And the goal would be, can I, can I roll back to an older version that's not encrypted? So versioning is a thing to look for in that particular case.
Yeah. Here's another uh, hacker. Again, they're coming in at all these different angles. Like before, the idea of, of actually infecting a router and then just parking on 500,000 routers, that was unheard of until last week. Here's another scenario where the uh, Austrian hotel, where they, they didn't attack the hotel's financial systems, they locked all the doors to the hotel rooms and the card keys no longer worked. They basically held that whole hotel uh, ransom uh, until they, they paid the, the ransom and were able to unlock those files. But that's just an example of kind of a, a completely out of the blue, unique way of attacking a business. Another one, this, this made uh, international news, but it's here locally. This is uh, Cockrell Hill here in, in the DFW area. They got infected with a ransomware attack. Uh, they, they lost eight years of digital evidence. Think about the impact of that on the criminal justice system. If your, uh, if your um, police officers cannot reproduce the evidence that was put, put somebody behind bars. So you can just imagine the impact of that particular uh, attack on this particular organization. And this, this is what the, that blue box is what the, the chief said. Everything that was lost is gone. Our automatic backup started after the infection, so it just backed up the infected files. That's that whole versioning we just talked about there. So again, versioning is critical. Here's uh, 15 ways to protect your business. Um, we may do an event in the fall to kind of step through these in more detail, but as you can see, those top three are the ones that I, I most strongly recommend, the backup being the A number one, backup versioned offsite. Um, and then Jim's gonna talk here briefly about cyber insurance. You probably don't have enough. So that would be my, my general consensus. Ask Jim, he'll give you some sense. It's all about your record count, right? And how many you could potentially lose because that's gonna drive the, the overall cost to your business if you were infected with a virus. Employee training and policies is the, is the number three. Uh, I tell you, the three and four, I'm gonna compete against. Uh, like I said, the ransomware attacks are coming in different directions now. So sometimes they're not targeting employees anymore. They're trying to use what's called RDP or remote desktop in order to infect your computers. They're going at the routers specifically. So um, I still say train your employees because they're definitely a big hole, but there's other ways to attack. So hard drive and email encryption. The benefit of hard drive encryption, if you're on Windows 10, it's free. You just need to turn it on. And if that's turned on and it's turned on on your server, if you have a ransomware attack, you can use that as a, as a legitimate defense against declaring a breach, which is gonna be the big uh, dollars that are gonna need to be spent. So um, consider three and four uh, as, as high priority um, uh, uh, items for you to take care of. I like popping this up. Here's 25 most common passwords. If you see your password up here, please change it right away when you get back to your office. Uh, but there, there are library, uh, there are dictionary attacks and all the likes. If you know, if you think using you know your your kid's name or your mother's maiden name plus one two three is the best password, be sure that it's it's already been thought of and will be part of a dictionary attack on on your systems. Here's another one. This is another um, uh, ransomware message. I called it out because it's very unique in its structure. A number one, restore your files. They call it the nasty way. You can basically, you see this hyperlink here? You can send that to two other people that you don't like very much, and they're gonna get infected with ransomware, and if they pay the fine, you get your key for free. So that's the nasty way of, dis, uh, of, of um, unlocking your computer. And, and why do we do it? It's interesting how, much you, how, how often you see in these particular um, attacks where they're justifying the reason they're attacking your system. So this one was a, a situation about Syria, you know, uh, a lot of people died and our family are, are gone and so I need to come and steal money from you is essentially what it says here. But it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a mental justification for, oh, and it even says at the bottom, we're extremely sorry. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly, I think there's some level of guilt that's going on in this particular industry, but at the same time it's happening. So th those are two kind of telling components to the psychology of the, of the hackers. So pop quiz, who remembers the three things that you can do to protect your business? Anybody? Yes, why? Come on. Anybody? Come on. Yes, at the back. Cyber insurance. Cyber insurance. Off Offsite backup. You don't know. Train your employees, right? Uh, Offsite versioned backup. And you have to test it. So that one's particularly important. All of those components are critical because a lot of times we'll go in there, they'll have a backup, it's running, 
uh, and then we'll go in and double click down on it and find out that it hasn't successfully completed in six months. Yes? The cyber interns, does that actually help you pay your at all? Or? It can. Uh, it's probably a better question for Jim if you want to uh, grab him. He's got a table out there or he's going to talk next right after me. So uh, I, I would do one of those two things. But it definitely covers the remediation costs. It covers potential fines that you're going to be, um, you're going to suffer. Uh, and it may, maybe it depends on the carrier, maybe it will help you uh, subsidize those costs. Not, not that you want to pay because again, First off, you're feeding the industry. Secondly, you're in a situation where you're probably not going to get the data back anyway. 72% of the people that pay didn't get, it, get all their information back. So it's, it's one of those situations where it's better to have that backup done ahead of time. Then you don't need to pay the ransom. It's still going to impact you, but you don't need to pay the ransom. But is it like if you didn't have the backup done, does it help you like hire a yeah. firm? Yeah, it will pay for a lot of the remediation costs to get your business up and running again. Yeah, yeah. We carry a million dollars as an IT firm in case we do something uh, uh, neglectful in that particular case. We actually have insurance that our clients can buy at a discount because we're doing all the things that we listed out here, and, and that allows them to get cheaper insurance for cyber insurance. Yes, sir? How do you I didn't touch too much on that. Cy uh, cell phones, um, the... the, the there are policies that you can implement organization-wide. There are three big things you need to do with phones. Um, uh, you need to encrypt them. You need to have a PIN or passcode. And you need to have a timeout. So if you do those three things, uh, a timeout. So basically, your phone will lock itself. If you left it there and walked out of the room, within five minutes, the phone would have locked itself. So with Apple, you know, with Apple phones, you know. Apple's actually pretty good. When you put a PIN or passcode on an Apple, it's already automatically encrypting that hard drive. So you're, most Apple folks are in, are in a good place right, right away, as long as they've got the pin or passcode and, and they set a timeout. So yes, three steps we already talked about what you can do. Um, a couple of offers we're making to the Colin Fanning County Medical Society members here is we can do a free dark web scan. I can't tell you how many times, and this would be against your entire domain. So whatever your domain is or your email address for your organization, we'll run a scan against that entire, uh, uh, every, every user inside that domain and come back and tell you if any of those users have their credentials out on the dark web. And sometimes we can even give you a partial password to give you some indication of, oh yeah, that's the one I use on most sites. So that, we will do that for free. And we'll also come in and complete a test restore of your, of your files. So if you're in one of those situations where you have a backup, but you're not 100% sure it's being done, or you know, your IT guy said, yeah, you're, you're covered, but you're still not 100% sure, we can come in and do a scan for free to make sure that, that data can be restored. And, and talk to you about some of the implications, the versioning, uh, whether or not it's a, it's a full uh, backup that can be restored quickly, or if you're going to have to go out there and reinstall applications and it'll take a week or two to get back up on your feet. So just head out to usmedicalit.com slash Colin Fanning County Medical Society or CFCMS and uh, sign up there and I will contact you guys and, and we'll, we'll help you with those particular steps. Any other questions? I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I think I just ended on time. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, you know, we're here as a resource. I've got business cards if you have questions. You know, I'm not going to charge you if you want to call and ask a, a couple of questions about IT or security or cybersecurity. Uh, feel free to come up after and, and we, can, we can chat about that. Or head out to our website. Just uh, let us know you're out there and you're interested and we'll reach out and, and help you with those two steps. And the presentation's out there as well. Yes, sir. Bitcoin is based on blockchain. Yes, yes. That's correct. Do you see any potential or possibility for the evil guys to come through blockchain? So the question was, can, can, could, could people use blockchain, that blockchain technology, as a backdoor into your EMR systems? The reason why Bitcoin is as successful as it is is because blockchain is a very reliable encryption technology that allows for anonymous uh, exchanging, uh, exchanging of information. It's not really a portal to get into somebody's um, uh, EMR system. For the most part, the fact that it's this secure, that people are willing to put their, their finances behind it, uh, it it's probably a, a better system than your current EMR encryption solution that you have out there. I, it, blockchain in of itself has huge potential to benefit society. It's just being used you know, in, in, a, in a very negative way when it comes to ransomware. But that doesn't mean that blockchain in and of itself is, is evil in any sense. 
And, and I don't think it, I, I'm not a blockchain expert, but I, I, don't, I don't believe it's going to open up a back door for you. Yeah. The question of maintaining your secrecy as an evil person. Yes. You can access uh, anyone else's uh, EMR. That's possible. It's possible. Evil is just as much in uh, EMR, the healthcare, as yeah. in, in getting, drawing money out of uh, people's accounts. I, I, it's almost a philosophical conversation, but I, I agree with you. I, th I think there's, there's huge potential, both positive and negative. Thank you, everyone, for, for uh, coming, and, and uh, hopefully we, it was helpful. We'll talk to you later.